two men. We are moving forward, America. Two parties. I represent a very different course. Two visions for the future. My country deserves better. I need you to keep believing in me. The race for the White House ends as America votes and the world waits. We're fighting for the future. To find out who will become the next president of the United States. I'm here to tell you that things are about to get a lot better. CCTV America's live special coverage of the 2012 U.S. presidential election from Washington, D.C. and around the globe begins right now. Welcome to CCTV America and our Washington Broadcast Center, the contest between President Obama and his Republican challenger, Mitt Romney, the governor, former governor of Massachusetts, is among the closest in recent American history. The election here is seen as giving Americans a clear choice between two separate visions. There are important distinctions in their international views as well and how the U.S. presidency will impact the world. During the next several hours, we'll focus on global perspectives. We have correspondents fanned out around the world in Beijing, Bogota, Bangkok, from Havana to Tel Aviv, Cairo, Nairobi, and London. We're also live at the Obama and Romney headquarters in Chicago and in Boston. And we will have live reports from the crucial swing states of Ohio and Florida. My colleague, Anna Naidu, will have a panel of foreign policy and election analysts with him throughout the evening. And Philip Yin will provide financial and business angles as well. But first, we're going to check in with Elaine Reyes. She'll be tapping into those global views during the hours ahead. Elaine. Good evening, Mike. I am here overlooking the north portico of the White House, the official residence and offices of the President of the United States. For nearly four years now, President Obama, his First Lady Michelle, and their daughters, Sasha and Malia, have lived here. And before we end our continuing coverage, we hope to tell you whether the Obama here for another four years or if they'll be moving in January to make room for another first family, that of Mitt Romney. Now, from this position above the White House, we'll be providing a unique global perspective on these elections. Our CCTV correspondents will track reaction from Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, and of course, our colleagues at CCTV World Headquarters in Beijing. In our cross to our Africa Broadcast Center, we will hear from Nairobi, Kenya, the birthplace of President Obama's father. Now to the world outside of Washington, who becomes president here matters, and our extended coverage will find out how and why. Mike, let's send it back to you. So much. Uh, we want to give you a quick look at who is ahead at this early hour. We will explain what the numbers mean for you in just a moment. We can tell you that uh, President Obama has claimed New York. Romney has won Texas and New Mexico, now going to Obama. So we'll get to those numbers in just a little bit. Well, here we're going to go to them just now. Uh, they should be coming up in just a moment. There we go. Here you're looking at the numbers as they are at this stage. Very early, some of these uh, too early to call, but we can tell you that right now, Mitt Romney, the former governor of Massachusetts, has uh, amassed 152 electoral votes, President Obama with 123. Now we'll have full coverage from the campaigns as well. Sean Caleb's is waiting for results at the Mitt Romney camp in Boston. Jessica Stone watching along with Obama supporters in Chicago. Jessica, what's the mood there right now? Well, we just heard New Jersey, New York, and Michigan get called, and a big, overwhelming support is, is uh, going on behind me. You can hear just how loud it already is in this room. Uh, there's an Obama video playing behind me as well that's eliciting a lot of cheers from from supporters here. There are a lot of campaign volunteers and supporters that have gotten tickets to be here, and they are pumped. You know, President Obama has spent much of his time on the stump, on the election trail, uh, talking about his last four years in office, his accomplishments there. We wanted to take a look at what got him to the White House and what he did while he was there. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. It all started with his message of unity at the Democratic National Convention in 2004. There is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. That you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. 
And after four years as a United States Senator, Barack Obama launched his bid for the White House. After a grueling primary, Obama became the first African-American president of the United States in 2009, taking the helm in the middle of two wars and a once-in-a-generation economic crisis. America, we cannot turn back. Not with so much work to be done. Within a month of taking office, President Obama signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, injecting $787 billion into the U.S. economy. But by the end of the year, nearly 10 percent of Americans were out of work. This is going to take a little while. Nearly a year later, the president signed an unprecedented overhaul of U.S. health care programs, offering lower cost health care to more Americans. It was a major campaign promise fulfilled. On August 19, 2010, another campaign promise kept as the last United States Combat Brigade left Iraq. But perhaps the most significant foreign policy achievement for President Obama came on May 1, 2011, when he gave the order to kill Osama bin Laden, bringing an end to a decade-long global manhunt for a man who ordered the September 11th attacks on the United States. Still left unfinished, a pledge to pass comprehensive immigration reform, close the detainee camps at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and most importantly, a promise to create more jobs for some of the 23 million unemployed and underemployed Americans now out of work. And the president has been criticized for not talking enough on the campaign trail about what he would do in the next four years. He did publish and distribute a pamphlet about his vision for America going forward and distributed that about two weeks before the election. But I can tell you, Mike, there is no doubt in this room what the president stands for and what he plans to do if reelected over the next four years. All right, Jessica Stone, live for us in Chicago. Thanks so much. We're going to check in now with Sean Calebs. He's in Boston. He has more on the candidate. Uh, people there are supporting that, of course, Mitt Romney. Well, Mike, if you look behind me, you can see the stage is set here for what the party faithful hope will be a red, white, and uh, blue celebration in just a matter of hours. Right now, the hundreds of people squeezed into the floor are listening to the Virginia governor speak with him. That, of course, Virginia, a very important swing state where candidate Romney spent a great deal of time campaigning just over this past week. Uh, without question, it has been a long, long trip for Mitt Romney. He is in Boston right now, and people are waiting to hear from him later on this evening. It has been a campaign that has been incredibly costly. It's gone on 17 months, but really, Mitt Romney's race to get to this point began a long time ago. Everywhere I go, I meet people who represent the best of America. Depending on who you ask, Mitt Romney has either been preparing his entire life to serve as President of the United States, or he's an affluent politician, out of touch and unable to connect with low income and middle class Americans. Willard Mitt Romney is 65 and was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1947. He went on to serve as governor of Massachusetts. Romney started a career as a businessman, founding the investment firm Bain Capital in 1984. As an independent financier, critics allege Bain was more of a jobs destroyer than a jobs creator but say the position did make Romney a much more wealthy man. Romney denies he made money at the cost of U.S. jobs, saying Bain was a positive experience and prepared him to deal with tough economic times. We're going to finally get America strong again with an economy to compete with anyone in the world. In 2002, he took over a high-profile job of running the Winter Olympics that were being held in Salt Lake City, Utah. By all accounts, he did a good job of steering the games from ethical and financial ruin into a major success. Heading into the first debate with Barack Obama, polls showed Romney trailing. But Romney came out energized, dominating the debate, accusing Obama of misleading American voters. Look, I got five boys. I, I'm used to people saying something that's not always true, but just keep on repeating it and ultimately hoping I'll believe it. He got an instant rise in the polls, but there have been missteps. In September, Romney didn't know someone in the audience was recording his comments as he issued what appeared to be an indictment on many poor and struggling Americans. Who believe that they're entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. A slip of the tongue or telling insight into what a candidate says when he thinks the cameras are off. It's a question voters will decide, and it could be a costly few seconds for a man who has spent his life positioning himself to lead the United States.
Well, Romney got off his campaign airplane just a couple of hours ago, looking somewhat drained, but clearly doing everything he could in this 11th hour. Really breaking from tradition, usually presidential candidates sequester themselves the day the results come in. And it's been an anxious day, Mike, waiting for those numbers to come in. Of course, we'll be here throughout the evening, Mike. Back to you. And it looks like it may be a long day's journey in tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Sean Caleb's reporting live from Boston Force. Let's go over to Anon and find out about some of the key differences between these two candidates. Thanks, Mike. And now, of course, there are some similarities between the two candidates, but of course, there are more differences, which is what this campaign has been all about. First, let's look at the topic of U.S. troops abroad. President Obama is moving more U.S. troops to East Asia, building up more of a presence around China. Now, on the Pentagon's budget, he wants to maintain spending at current levels. In Iran, he says, quote, all options are on the table and so far has imposed what he calls crippling economic sanctions on the country to deter it from a nuclear program. On Syria, he proposes, or rather opposes, any U.S. military intervention. Now, Governor Romney supports that move to East Asia. And as far as the military budget is concerned, he wants to increase spending by up to $2 trillion. On Iran, he says he would impose even more stringent sanctions on Tehran, but supports the president's reluctance to use U.S. troops in Syria. Now, where the two candidates really differ the most is on U.S. domestic policy. Let's take a look at that. Governor Romney wants to reform the tax code, cutting rates for all Americans. He favors reducing uh, the uh, cutting rates for all Americans, reducing the foreign aid budget, and opposes a government mandate that compels everyone to get health insurance. And on energy, he wants more onshore and offshore oil development, leading to North American independence, energy independence, that is, by 2020. President Obama, on the other hand, wants to raise taxes only on the highest income earners in the United States. He wants to give tax incentives for, to companies that hire American workers. His health care bill mandate requires all Americans to buy insurance. And on energy, he wants to get 80 percent of U.S. energy from sources other than oil by 2035. Now, of course, Mike, we are going to be looking at a lot more of the differences between these two candidates as the night unfolds, but for now, it's over to you. All right, thanks so much. The big question on everyone's mind right now is likely who's ahead. And right now, we can tell you we're going to have a bar up here throughout the evening that will identify how the, uh, the electoral votes are shaking out. And, uh, of course, the first person to reach the magic number of 270 wins. It's part of a confusing system, which needs a little bit of explaining. Electing a U.S. president. The U.S. presidential election is held every four years, always on the first Tuesday of November. Democrats and Republicans make up the two major political parties, but there are also independent candidates on the ballot. Votes are counted state by state, each with a given number of electoral votes. The candidate with the majority of the popular vote takes the electoral votes in each state. The total electoral count is 538. The first person to get to 270 wins the presidency. The president is inaugurated on January 20th of next year. All right, let's look at some of the latest states that have been won by both candidates. New Jersey and New York uh, were likely to go with uh, President Obama. They do, as does New Mexico. Of course, his home state of Illinois also in his camp. Texas, Oklahoma, South Dakota, and Georgia going for Governor Mitt Romney. And uh, we're going to look at the map now and take a look at it. There it is. In fact, I can hit a couple of these states. New York, that goes with the Obama. This one down here going Texas is going to go to uh, Romney. And the numbers will start filling in. First, though, I'd like to explain who this guy is. It's Alan Lickman, <laughs> a very distinguished professor at American University and also uh, a man who not only talks about history, you're able to predict history. You've come up with some uh, components, some keys to uh, identify whether or not an incumbent uh, president is in danger. And you feel like uh, Barack Obama is not. I first made my call, believe it or not, for this election in January 2010 <laughs> in the International Journal of Information Systems. You can all go look it up. And at that time, I said, looking at the fundamental features of the election, things like the economy, but not just the economy, foreign policy successes and failures, social unrest, policy change, scandal, the balance of factors favored Barack Obama, and here we are on election night, and my prediction has not changed. And this procedure, the keys to the White House, have correctly called every election from 1984 to 2008 ahead of time. Let's, uh, let's take a look now. I'm going to hit this here, and we're going to pull, yeah. some, pull down some of these. 
Now, one of the things you talk about is primary contest. Absolutely. And Ronald Reagan challenged Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford lost. Jimmy Carter, Ted Kennedy challenged him. So this is really a key component. No primary contest this it's time around. It's really important, and let me explain why. Because if you've governed poorly, you're likely to confront a challenge with your own, within your own party. If your own party can't support you, it's hard to expect the American people as a whole to support you. So that is certainly a key that most people might not pay attention to, but is in fact very, very important. It's a huge factor. Third party candidates, we yeah. saw this with Ross Perot uh, hurting George H.W. Bush in his campaign. Without Ross Perot, according to my system, George H.W. Bush would have been reelected in 1992. Now we do have some third party candidates on the ballot, but none of them are significant enough to make a tilt in the election. The third party key goes to Obama. And uh, we've got a couple others, but let me, let me hit on Romney for a second, because we want to get into this as well. Yeah. These are some of the things that actually work in his favor. That's Can right. you talk to us about the mandate? The mandate is the midterm elections. The one time during the term, the voters have a, ch a chance to pass judgment on the incumbent administration. And we know the Republicans won big in the midterm elections of 2010. It was a huge defeat for Barack Obama. Chalk that one up for the Republicans. The economy, a lot of people coming out, these exit polls saying economy very important. That should play to his, play to his hand as well, but it's not enough, you don't think? It's not enough. I actually split the economy into two factors. One kind of how the economy's been doing throughout the term, and that's bad for Obama and good for Romney, as we know. And then the second one is, is the economy actually in recession? during the election campaign. And we know the economy is out of the recession. It's not a good economy. Mm -hmm. It's not the recovery that we want, but it's not the deep recession that might have elected Romney. And the other thing is uh, charisma. You say that Mitt doesn't have enough to actually upend the president in that category. He's well. no Ronald Reagan, <laughs> I have to say that. <laughs> Alan, we'll be checking in with you throughout. But right now, one of the biggest issues influencing this race, of course, is the U.S. unemployment rate, which is just under 8%. For a closer look, let's go to our business anchor, Philip Yen. He's going to come into the mix now. Phil. All right, Mike, welcome to Studio B here. And you're right, massive unemployment, a serious concern. And we talk about jobs, jobs, jobs. But in this case, it's really the lack of jobs that voters are very much focused on in this election. And this is an issue that simply won't go away. Candidate Romney has talked about creating more jobs. President Obama has talked about his record of creating jobs in the United States. And it's been a difficult four years for President Obama trying to move those numbers. Michelle McCorry is at the headquarters of the NASDAQ in New York City. And she takes a look at us, for us, the last four years. Phil, in September 2012, U.S. unemployment fell to 7.8%. Now, the last time it stood at that level was 1992, and another Democratic candidate, Bill Clinton, won the presidency that year, focusing on the economy. For the 20-year period prior to Barack Obama taking office, U.S. unemployment averaged 5.5% a year. Fast forward to January 2009. Obama takes the oath of office. The unemployment rate then was 7.8%, and it was the start of the Great Recession. Unemployment climbed over 9% and stayed there for the next three years. Then, just two months before Election Day 2012, unemployment fell. For the third time in two decades, it edged just below 8%. Now, unemployment is lower, but not low enough to get Obama out of a re-election red zone. Americans have not sent a president back to the White House with unemployment this high since just before World War II in 1940. The president then was FDR. Now, another U.S. president from that era, Roosevelt's successor, Harry Truman, said, it's a recession when your neighbor loses his job. It's a depression when you lose yours. And Americans seem to agree with Truman and vote accordingly. So if Obama wins with unemployment this high, He'll have done what no other incumbent has done in more than 70 years. All right, at this time I want to introduce Stephen Roach, senior lecturer and senior fellow at Yale University. Thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure gonna, to be with you, Phil. We're going to have a long evening together, but before mm -hmm. we get started with this um, Q&A, I want you to take a listen at what the president and what the governor had to say about jobs. You know, in 2008, we were in the middle of two wars and the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And today, our businesses have created nearly five and a half million new jobs. And this morning, we learned that companies hired more workers in October than at any time in the last eight months. He said he was going to lower the unemployment rate down to 5.2% right now. 
Today we learned that it's actually 7.9%, and that's 9 million jobs short of what he promised. Unemployment is higher today than when Barack Obama took office. Think of that. Unemployment today is higher on, than on the day Barack Obama took office. All right. We now have a discussion with Stephen Roach about this. And, you know, you heard both the governor and also the president talk about the jobs figure. Is it possible they're both right? No, they're not. Uh, the labor market is in terrible shape. With all due respect to the president, what you heard from him was spin. The, the unemployment rate is 7.9% today on the basis of the, the published numbers. But, Philip, that excludes 5 million Americans who have just given up looking for work uh, since 2006. Uh, and, and sadly, our statisticians don't count them. You know, if you surrender the job search, they take you out of the survey. Is that ridiculous or not? Throw those guys back in, just that one calculation alone takes the unemployment rate to 11%. All right, bef That's a terrible number. Before you go there, uh, I know, Matt, we've got a chart of the, the jobs data over the past couple of years that we can put up and Stephen can take a look at it, but it's a, it's a chart that shows the unemployment rate dropping since President Obama took office to where we are today. Isn't it true that the job market is better than when President Obama took office? Again, if I, if, if I put all the people in the workforce who used to be in just a few years ago, the unemployment rates come down, but it's come down from 12 to 11 percent, and it's not the 7.9 percent that the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported uh, last Friday. So sure, it's, it's improved, but I mean, an 11 percent adjusted unemployment rate, that, that is a horrific number. I would not call that improvement by any stretch of the imagination, Philip. One point of controversy has been the fact that Ben Bernanke is now known as the quantitative easing Fed chairman. We had one, right. two, three, and so on. Very creative man. There, there are a lot of jokes about this, but there's a lot of serious discussion about this because candidate Romney, if he does in fact get elected, has said that he would find a new Fed chairman, which means possibly the end of quantitative easing. In your view, has quantitative easing helped or hurt the economy? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a subtle um, way to answer it, but we've had three rounds of quantitative easing, better known in the trade as QE. The first round came in the depths of the crisis, and that really put a floor on markets uh, in, in chaos, and, and I'd say that worked. The second round, the third round, we've also done something called Operation Twist. I will not bore you or your viewers with that. Uh, I don't think they've worked. Uh, if they have worked, the, the returns have been uh, minimal, and they really don't address the fundamental problems that are ailing American families, which are balance sheet problems, no saving uh, and too much debt. So what worked once has, has, has really pretty much failed the second, third, and you know, the subsequent times that, that lie ahead. All right, good stuff. We're going to have much more on this. For Great. now, we send it back to Mike. All right, Phil, we're ready to call another state, Pennsylvania, which was key, in fact, so key that Romney visited it today, which was a break with tradition. He visited the state of Pennsylvania, hoping to gather enough votes. It didn't go his way. The latest state won, of course, Barack Obama picking up 20 very important electoral votes here. So the numbers now adding up 174 electoral votes for Romney, 129 for, uh, oh, went the wrong way, excuse me. I'll go back. This thing's very sensitive. There we go. 149 for Barack Obama, 154 for the former governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney. Let's, uh, let's check in with Elaine now and see uh, what's up with her. All right, Mike, thank you so much. You know, the relationship between the United States and China is perhaps the most significant superpower alliance in the world at this very moment. Now, many of the world's current challenges really depend on these two nations achieving cooperation, continued cooperation. But like any marriage, there have been growing pains. The financial part of their relationship, for instance, has been the source of much debate between the two candidates on the campaign trail. Now, the national debt in the United States has soared to $16 trillion over the past year, an almost incomprehensible number. China holds some of that debt, but so does Japan and several other in, uh, international uh, investors. So, Mike, we're going to send it back to you, but in just a little while, we plan to check in with our colleagues in Beijing. All right, Elaine, a big call just now. Ohio, which was one of these key swing states, it has just gone blue. 
which means that it goes to Barack Obama. 167 electoral votes. He now takes the lead in Allen. This is critical, isn't it? In this, uh, this was the path to victory for Romney, was it not? I think this is game, set, and match. No Republican in modern history has won the presidency without winning Ohio. And right now, the three big prizes, the three big battleground states were Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And Obama has won two of the three. If you look at the remaining states, there just really isn't a path to 270 for Mitt Romney. Now, strange things can happen, but I would say I am 99% confident that my prediction of two and a half years ago is going to be realized tonight and Obama's going to and, win. And this is a projection from CNN. Uh, some of the other uh, networks, I believe, are not going as far as uh, declaring Ohio. There's I looked at Ohio. I looked at the actual election results. I can guarantee to you Obama's going to win Ohio. Let's talk about Ohio because one of the things that's critical is this northern part of the state. This, the central part of that's the state right. uh, can go either way. That's try, right. Try and hold it even. The southern part of the state is critical if you want to win as a Republican. So what are you seeing in your numbers? What I'm seeing in my numbers is big numbers out of Cuyahoga County, which is Cleveland, and big numbers out of some of those other counties surrounding it, and reasonable numbers in the red areas, but nowhere near big enough to overtake the lead that uh, Barack Obama has in the traditional Democratic areas. I see him winning, so far, the Cleveland area by 70-30. That's just extraordinary. And we're looking at the numbers right now. Uh, again, Ohio, uh, Barack Obama leading 54% of the vote out of the precincts reporting, Mitt Romney with 45%. So uh, at this point in time, it looks as though uh, Barack Obama with a comfortable lead. Uh, as Alan Lickman pointed out, he's been studying the key precincts and the key counties. And at this stage, it looks to you as though Ohio is definitely going to end up in Barack Obama's column tonight. Again, uh, as the great Disraeli said, finality is not a word we use in politics, but 99.9% .9 sure that Obama that Ohio is going for Obama. And some of these key states, we're talking about uh, Michigan and Ohio. Yes. Uh, the auto industry, so key. Can you talk about that and, and how this may have played in this election? In fact, let's take a look. We've got a fly and we'll show you the, yeah. the state as it, as it appears. And we can also talk about, uh, historically, these 18, uh, these 18 electoral votes, very important, and they can go either way. This is why we call it a That's swing right. state. It's in the 2000, president maker state, exactly. Ohio. In 2008, Obama won it. Bush won in 2004. Right. And you, you make a very good point. It's the president making. There has been no Republican that has ever won the contest as president without taking Ohio. Got to have Ohio. And the auto bailout was huge. According to the exit polls, nearly 60 percent of voters approved of the bailout. Only somewhere in the mid-30s disapproved. That's an enormous headwind for Barack Obama going into the state of Ohio, and partly because of the auto bailout, which, remember, has uh, spillover effects on lots of other industries. Ohio has a much lower unemployment rate than the national average. Those national averages can be very, very deceiving when you're fighting state by state. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can do the fly into Florida as well, because that was, the, we're talking about 2004, how important this was. He, he won it just by two percentage points. Florida was the one in 2000, right. and this one also a big, big prize, 29 electoral votes here. And this one right now seems to be leaning in Obama's favor as well. I would say I'm about 90 percent confident that Obama is going to win Florida because the latest results I saw were about even. But Broward County and Dade County, the counties in, the, in South Florida, are huge Democratic counties with very large caches of votes, and only small percentages of those counties were counted in the results I saw. So I think once those counties come in, I'm pretty confident Obama's going to have the trifecta, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And that makes it absolutely impossible for Romney to win. Can he can he get some of these other swing states and cobble together enough? Is there's no, just no way. Zero chance if Obama wins Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Almost zero chance even if Obama loses Florida because he's won Pennsylvania and Ohio, he's won Michigan. I mean, Romney would have to win every single other swing state, including states like Wisconsin and Nevada, which seem a bit out, out of his reach, as well as Virginia, North Carolina, New Hampshire, you name it. <laughs> All right. Well, Alan Lickman going out there on a limb for I'm us tonight. I'm on the limb, but I always do that. <laughs> We're going to check back in with Elaine now. Thanks, Mike. You know, 
China has been mentioned so many times on the campaign trail by both President Obama and Mitt Romney. And as Mike mentioned, a lot of developments taking place right now here in the United States. But for more on what this means to China, let's check in with my colleague in Beijing, Zhou Yue. Zhou, what can you tell us about how China sees this election? Well, good evening, Elaine. Of course, a lot of the Chinese have been watching the American presidential race with modest interest. But the interest is obviously not very deep. Uh, for average Chinese, they don't understand the details of the American uh, politics and presidential race. They don't even know which candidate is for what. And over the past decades, the public knowledge about the American politics and presidential election is just limited. But one thing they worry most that they care is what America is going to deal with China in the future. And another thing, uh, the Chinese are going to see their own leadership change in just a few, way, few days. Well, maybe that is more important for them. At the 2012 U.S. presidential debates, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney talked a lot about domestic issues. And with respect to China, the rise of China, China's both an adversary, but we don't have to be an adversary in any way, shape, or form. We can work with them if it's following the rules. And from across the Pacific Ocean, Chinese netizens have taken note. So far, the debates have generated over one million comments on China's largest microblogging site. There are huge fans. I watched the second debate. It was splendid. The moderator and those who asked questions didn't hold back just because they were questioning the president and the former governor and those who are less impressed. They had a good time at the debates, but America's economic problems remain unanswered. But not all take the race seriously. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. This video showing Obama lookalike dancing got crazy hits in China. To get a better idea, we took to the streets. I like the current president, Obama, because he's the first African-American president. He was going to uh, create jobs. Remember? They are also supporters of Romney. Romney is pro-China, while the Obama administration has been anti-China. And as for the official reaction, it has been consistent. U.S. politicians, no matter what party they're from, should view China's development in an objective and rational light and should do more for China-U.S. mutual trust and cooperation. And the question was, how much did you cut them by? Well, interestingly, according to a Pew Research, over 50 percent of the Chinese have a negative view of the U.S. I guess it's almost the same the other way around, because the rationale behind both candidates bashing China's strategy is that it is popular. The American people want to see their president go tough on China. But after the election, I guess they have to become realistic because they understand what is at stake if the relationship between China and the U.S. go under. Elaine? All right, so yeah, thank you so much. Reporting from Beijing, of course, we'll check in with him throughout this evening's broadcast. Mike, let's send it back to you in our Washington studio. All right, Elaine, thanks so much. So here's where we stand right now, a very tight race where anything is possible, and we're just getting started here in Washington, D.C. It's not a matter of one man. The world patiently waiting. It's up to both sides to, to come up with some answers. A team of correspondents. This is Stephanie Freed in Tel Aviv. I'm Frank Contreras in Mexico City. Standing by. I'm Michelle Vega in Bogota, and I will be bringing you the latest from Colombia, the U.S.'s strongest ally in Latin America. This is Stephen Gibbs in Rio de Janeiro. Brazil is Latin America's economic powerhouse. And the issue Brazilians most care about in this election is the state of the U.S. economy. CCTV's live coverage of the 2012 U.S. election continues now. Of course, for the candidates, one of the most important aspects of this election is getting supporters out to the polls. Consider this. In 2008, President Obama turned the historically Republican state of Virginia into a Democratic victory by a 6 percent margin, an accomplishment last seen in 1965. Both campaigns left nothing to chance this time around when it came to voter turnout strategies. Rochelle, Rochelle Acufo explains. And they have to Across the United States, in the final hours, thousands of volunteers staged a final drive to get out the vote. Virginia has been among the tightest races, 
While Republicans have been favored, the Democrats have been motivated to push hard to get more registered voters to the polls. For Democrats, the percentage game is key. They have a larger pool of voters and over 800 field offices nationwide, nearly twice that of Republicans. The most effective way is to call. I have folks on my campaign team that will be going door to door, knocking on doors, telling people to come and vote. Um, we also are going to do what they call drag and knock, or knock and drag actually, so where you knock on a door and then you drive somebody right from there to the polls. For Republicans, the use of data mining and internet-linked telephones means organizers can swiftly distinguish firm supporters from those who are still undecided and canvass accordingly. Good afternoon. I'm a volunteer with the Romney campaign, and we've got a really close election this year. Knocking on neighbors' doors has been an effective method of influencing voters since the 1800s, but social media has amplified the peer pressure effect in these elections. A recent study of Facebook users found more than 300,000 voters headed to the polls in 2010 after seeing a posting showing their friends had voted. The quest to secure votes doesn't end today. Technological advancements allow partisan political groups to combine voter registration files with vast pools of consumer data. That will help identify voters they're likely to sway in future elections. Rochelle Akufo, CCTV, Alexandria, Virginia. All right, we're ready to call another state for you. Wisconsin will go blue. It goes for Barack Obama. Surprised? No, uh, not at all. They, Republicans thought they could maybe become competitive in Wisconsin, which was pretty well conceded as a Democratic state for two reasons. The recall election of the Republican Governor Scott Walker failed, and of course Romney Pitt picked uh, Congressman Ryan from mm -hmm. Wisconsin as his running mate. But that never works. You know, you can't win a state just by picking a running mate. They were hoping to be competitive in Wisconsin, but if it's being called this early, it couldn't have been all that competitive. Let's take a look at the fly-in of Wisconsin, and we can uh, dig just a little bit deeper for you and give you a little bit more facts about this state. Again, very important, it's uh, 10 electoral votes. And let's take a look at what's happened there in the recent past. In 2008, Obama won by 14 yeah. percentage points. John Kerry also won here in 2004, so reliably Democratic. It's pretty reliably Democratic, and it was always a long shot. You know, Republicans were hoping to take some traditionally Democratic states and put them in play, namely Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and that does not seem to have come to pass for them. And Michigan was another tough sale. We talked about this, the, the auto industry. Talk to me a little bit about Pennsylvania, the dynamics there. You've got big cities like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. They probably going in the, in the uh, Obama column. The big cities overwhelmingly were going for Obama. And from what I've heard, and I can't verify this, turnout seems to be pretty big this year. We had a big turnout year in 2008. And high turnout always favors the Democrats, because the Democrats tend to be supported by minorities and less affluent people who have less of a propensity to turn out than others. So big turnout favors the Democrats. And in Pennsylvania, the Republicans adopted a very stringent photo identification law, which may have prevented some minorities and poor people from voting, but the courts struck it down, at least for this election, saying you can't use it this time. And that was a big win for the Democrats. Alan, one other thing that we want to talk a little bit about is the uh, voter turnout before the election. I mean, this, this was incredible, unprecedented. How many people actually voted before the election, including the president of the United States? Well, it could be something like 30 percent of the entire electorate voted early. And again, this is a good thing for Democrats. One of the interesting dynamics of American politics is this. The Republican base tends to be a base of white Protestants and conservative white Catholics. It's a very high turnout base, but demographically, it's a shrinking base. The Democratic base is heavily comprised of African Americans and Hispanics who are a low turnout but rising Let, base. Let's hold it there because we're going to check in with Jessica Stone. Okay. She's at the Obama headquarters right now with the latest from Chicago. And Mike, this room is increasingly more and more electric as these results come in. Cheers are rippling throughout the room. And many of these uh, are folks in this room are campaign volunteers who have been part of that unprecedented get out the vote effort in the states. Uh, this is a reward to them. They are cheering as they're watching uh, a video made for them by the campaign with snippets of the campaign trail of the president rallying them, of the vice president and first lady 
rallying them. And of course, the presidential playlist is at, uh, is in full effect here. But just a little bit more about the get out the vote effort in this campaign. I mean, they have hundreds and hundreds of offices throughout the country concentrated on the swing states. Uh, I was looking through the announcements I got from the campaign through Twitter and through their app today. I got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four announcements here just encouraging me to get out the vote, to call other people to get out the vote, to go to vote, and to volunteer for the campaign. So this campaign is using social media. They're, they have been sending out videos to encourage the youth vote, which is a big part of their constituency. Some 16 to 18 percent of the youth uh, put this election, this candidate, into office four years ago, and they're counting on young people in the United States to put the president back into office for another four years, uh, and, and, as well as women and Hispanics and African Americans, as we heard from Alan. Uh, but the, the group of people here is really excited. I mean, this is grueling work. They've been uh, calling the same people again and again. They've been knocking on the same doors again and again. And so uh, this is really, uh, for them, a reward as they watch these returns come in. All right, Jessica, thanks so much. Jessica Stone reporting from Chicago, Illinois. And now let's take a look at Ohio again. Um, everyone projected this is too early to call, except for Alan Lickman, who believes that Ohio will end up in the win column for Obama tonight. He does lead by seven percentage points. We're going to check in with Craig Morrow, who's in Cincinnati, Ohio, to get the latest from the state of Ohio. That's right. Well, in the run up to this election, a lot of people, many people were saying that this night could come down to what happens here in Ohio. This is a key battleground state and it has 18 electoral votes and whoever gets those votes, it's thought could push them uh, over the edge uh, to into the winner position. Now, re re reflecting that both of the candidates have campaigned very intensely in this state over the past few weeks. That's in terms of physical presence. Uh, the candidates uh, from both sides coming for rallies and events and also in terms of spending on advertising. The two sides combined uh, spent more than $200 million here. Now it's a big state and it's a difficult one to carry and that is because it has a wide variety of geographic and demographic diversity. James Faison walks through what he calls his second home, one of the oldest auto worker union halls in the United States. Faison was laid off from Chrysler's Jeep factory in the city of Toledo in 2009, just as the U.S. auto industry teetered on the edge of bankruptcy. This time was unique because of the uh, commercials, the, the, the talk of Chrysler closing its doors forever, made a lot of people very, you know, unsure about their future in the automotive industry here. A year later, though, Faison had his job back. Chrysler now plans to hire 1,100 more people in Toledo by next year as it ramps up production. For many here, none of it would have happened without President Obama's $80 billion bailout of the auto industry. It's only because of the decision that he made that allowed so many of my colleagues to look forward to um, a future. Blue Collar Toledo is similar to other northern Ohio cities, industrialized areas where labor unions play an important role in mobilizing votes for the Democratic Party. As one travels further south in this crucial swing state, the rural economy is more agricultural and the people more socially conservative. Locals like their traditions, like the strawberry pie at the spot to eat diner in the town of Sydney. In this area, there's a, a dominance of Catholic and they are totally against abortion and you know saying that you gotta supply contraceptives and stuff like that. So Romney's got a good track record here. Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney campaigned here and his message that President Obama has no plan for the next four years has resonated. I've never heard of a clear plan, and like I said, you know, to me, he just talks in circles. He talks around what needs to be done, but he doesn't say how he's going to do it. And so far in the last four years, I haven't seen anything done. Uh, Craig, let's talk a little bit about these provisional ballots, because if this thing is close in Ohio, that is going to be one of these, uh, it's not necessarily the hanging chads of Florida, but it could take a long time to gather all those and, and count them, right? It could end up like that. You know, the United States has this patchwork of, le of electoral laws. Each state decides its own election laws. And in Ohio, they have decided uh, that these provisional ballots will be counted 10 days from today. Uh, and a provisional ballot is a ballot that is cast 
in the traditional way, but that it is marked as provisional because there's some kind of discrepancy either in the address uh, of the voter or something having to do with the ID that they showed to vote uh, or, or some kind of technicality like that. The state holds on to those ballots, counts them down the road, and uh, if they reject the ballot, then the individual voter has the right to challenge that. Now, you can see that turning into a very lengthy and complicated process. Uh, the, both parties have lawyers standing by to start filing lawsuits uh, if this happens. And there's a lot of talk that if Ohio is indeed very close, if there's a razor thin margin here, then this could become a big issue. To give you some perspective for the numbers, in the last election in 2008, there were about 200,000 uh, provisional ballots. Now, uh, Obama beat John McCain then by about 260,000 votes, so those ballots wouldn't have counted. But if the, if the uh, margin is going to be as thin as the polls and a lot of people are expecting, then those ballots, ballots will be important and we could see uh, controversy regarding them. All right, Craig Morrow reporting live from Cincinnati for us. And again, uh, the latest numbers we had, 36% of the precincts reporting from Ohio and the president leading by seven percentage points there. 12 million Hispanics registered to vote in the 2012 election. Their growing numbers in battleground states like Florida may actually decide the presidency. CCTV's Nitsa Soledad Perez is in Florida to pick up that part of the story for us. Nitsa. Well, if you think the Latino vote is a monolithic uniform vote, think again. National polls indicate that Latinos tend to favor the Democratic Party, but it depends on who you ask. I had the opportunity to chat politics with two different families in South Florida. Opinions were diverse. However, they agreed on one thing. Their main concern is not immigration, it's the economy. I vote for Romney, Obama, 100%. I've changed my mind many times, but in the last two or three months and the debate kind of like turned me into Romney. In this household of four, three go for Romney and one for Obama. I just don't think that now we're going to give him another chance to do something that he promised to fix and he didn't do it. I think that we, it was good that we had our first black president. I think there was a, a lot of challenges that he took on and he met, some that he didn't. But I think Romney has the knowledge to turn the economy around. In this musical family, the parents and the little sister are Republicans. But this 10-year-old who can't vote yet has a mind of his own. Obama, because Romney, he wants to take certain um, rights away from women. And Obama, he has medical insurance, so if you break a leg or you hurt one of your body parts, you have medical insurance that Obama gives you. A few miles north lives Michelle Pacheco and her family. She's Puerto Rican and has been living in Miami for 14 years. I think that people have to give Obama a chance. He's only been in office four years. In my particular job, which is real estate, um, the housing market is better than in 2009, not only in Miami, but nationally. As a mother of twin girls, she wants education funding to be extended and someone who is a strong advocate of women's rights. Back at the home of Republican voters, Peter Lopez and Olga Dagger, after election day is over, they'll put behind their family and be out there again looking for jobs in an economy still in a precarious state. Well, these families represent the needs of the Latino community. Jobs and economic stability are their main worries. Now, over time, the Latino vote has become a more discerning block that does not appreciate to be taken for granted. And one fact that politicians need to take into consideration is that every month for the next two decades, 50,000 Hispanics will turn 18 years old. And what does that mean? 50,000 new likely voters every month for the next 20 years. Mike. Mm, impressive statistics. Nisa, thanks so much. Now let's turn to Elaine, and she's going to give us the very latest on the global perspective. That's right, th Mike. Thank you so much. We want to get more perspective now from Latin America. We have special team coverage from CCTV correspondents across the continent to get reaction to the 2012 U.S. presidential election. First up is Frank Contreras. He joins us live from Mexico City, and uh, it's one of America's closest neighbors, Frank. Two big stories coming out of Mexico and the United States right now involve immigration and the drug war. 
What can you tell us about how Mexicans are viewing the U.S. presidential election? Well, looking around the map, across this very massive Latin American nation, Elaine, this is one of the most populated Latin uh, Spanish-speaking countries in the entire world. And so uh, people have personal ties to the United States here because over the years so many people have gone, hundreds of thousands of Mexicans, people like me, myself, my family, we're uh, of Mexican descent and so we're watching this uh, from abroad over here. And of course the main issues as you say over the years, over the decades really have been immigration and even the drug war. The drug war uh, dating back to President Nixon's time back when this, he said that a drug war should be fought and won here in Latin America and so this has been going on for many decades here. The real issue though lately that's tying these two countries together is trade, by far trade. The uh, United States and Mexico are massive trading partners. If you just take a look at the kind of trade that went on in 2011, more than $460 billion in commerce crossed this massive border between the United States and Mexico, about 3,000 kilometers of borderland space there, which has over the decades also become quite militarized, Elaine. And so um, trade is a major issue. And of course, in the state of Texas alone, they received $114 billion in trade in 2010. That number has been growing year after year. It's quadrupled in the last two decades. Decades, Elaine. And so you can see that there are very many reasons for why um, Mexican policymakers are keeping a very careful eye on what happens in this presidential election north of the border here. Um, most Mexican citizens themselves, frankly, are not watching tonight. They might be watching soap operas and that sort of thing, um, attending to their family's needs after they come home from a, a long day of work, but they're probably not watching the election. It will be covered live across uh, network television here inside this country, though, and, and it will be across all newspaper headlines uh, on all front pages tomorrow, Elaine. Well, speaking of leadership changes, Frank, New Mexico inaugurates its next president December 1st. Enrique Peña Nieto, what does he expect out of the U.S. president as he comes into office? Well, the incoming president-elect of Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto, as you said, will be sworn into office on December 1st. And he uh, is quickly trying to establish ties with Washington. He's working behind the scenes as we speak. Now they've got teams inside the, the U.S. Capitol in um, New York City as well, dealing with Wall Street and those sorts of matters. And so they're months, weeks ahead of, of the um, inauguration of Mexico's president-elect, already trying to shore up ties with whoever is going to take the White House. Um, there's expectations from here that it's likely to be a Democrat once again, but they're waiting to see what comes out of this very tight race in the United States. And so Enrique Peña Nieto, absolutely very interested in who the next president of the United States will be and hoping to show very quickly that he's going to be a strong ally again in trade issues and specifically now of course in security matters and that's because more than 60,000 people have been killed in drug related violence and the United States is concerned. Okay Frank Contreras reporting live from Mexico City thank you so much we'll check back with you later on in our show let's send it back to you Anna Naindu in our Washington studio with a closer look at all of this. Thanks, Elaine. And in the studio, I have with me Laura Carlton, who's director of the Americas Program at the Center for International Policy, and Doug Paul, who is vice president for studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Laura, let me start with you. You know, there wasn't much of a focus on Latin America during uh, the campaigns, and that's understandable because, you know, internet, these uh, politics is about local issues, domestic issues. But we didn't even hear much about Latin America during that third debate, which focused on uh, foreign affairs. Why is that? Well, Latin America was pretty much ignored during the campaigns. And the first reason is because among foreign policy issues, it's not a hot spot. It's not a place where there's open conflict and it's not considered really a national security threat to the United States. So that's the first reason. And I think the second reason is that really neither candidate, including the president, has a coherent Latin American policy. It's been low priority the entire time. We really haven't seen much of a policy on the part of President Obama and in the platform of the Republican Party, we've seen even, even less. This is a real concern to Latin Americans because they believe that they should be getting more attention than they have so far. Okay. It is, though, an important trading partner. Let's listen to what Mitt Romney said during their third debate about trade with Latin America. Let's watch. 
We're going to increase our trade. Trade grows about 12% per year. It doubles about every, every five or, or so years. We can do better than that, particularly in Latin America. The opportunities for us in Latin America, we have just not taken advantage of fully. As a matter of fact, Latin America's economy is almost as big as the economy of China. We're all focused on China. Latin America is a huge opportunity for us. Doug, has that been an opportunity lost for the United States? And, you know, as Laura pointed out, there isn't a coherent policy when it comes to Latin America. You're talking about Latin America. Yes. Yeah, it has been. The administration was very slow to come to approve the free trade agreements. Uh, with the Latin countries that had been reached in the Bush administration and uh, that was inconsistent with President Obama's uh, specific statement that he wanted to double our exports in five years. Uh, Laura, when we get back to Latin America and how whichever administration takes office at the White House after this election, how do they deal with some of the important things that have caused differences between the United States and Latin America, you know, specifically Venezuela and Hugo Chavez? Cuba, it's an ongoing issue. I mean, do they continue these isolationist policies which this, you know, the past government and previous administrations uh, have followed, or do they start now engaging with people like Hugo Chavez and with the Cuban leadership? Well, I think that'll depend a lot on who gets into office in these mm -hmm. elections. Because on the one hand, President Obama has thawed relations with Cuba a little bit. We have uh, more travel permissions and remittances have loosened up some and there may be a chance to continue thawing that embargo. A Romney presidency would not do that. In Venezuela, the antagonism between the two countries has been obvious and would probably continue either way. And then you have, on the other hand, these southern cone countries, the very important Brazil and Argentina. Right. And these countries don't have a conflict with the United States the way that mm -hmm. Venezuela and Cuba do an ideological conflict. But they've been making declarations of independence okay. to create more South-South ties. Okay, we have lots more to talk about, but for now, let's send it back to our correspondent, Elaine Reyes. All right, thanks, Anand. Let's check in with uh, Michael Voss, who's standing by live for us in Havana, Cuba, staying with our Latin American coverage. Michael, are there clear differences between Obama, Obama and Romney over Cuba? Elaine, Mitt Romney has the support of the anti-Castro Cuban-American lobby. They hope that he'll reverse President Obama's measures easing U.S.-Cuban contacts and allowing Cuban-Americans to visit relatives and send remittances home. But no one's quite clear. This is the first election in many years that neither candidate has made any major policy statements on Cuba. In fact, in the last uh, presidential debate it didn't even feature this was on foreign policy and it took place in Florida well what is the Cuban government's position or do they have a p official position on the US presidency well the the official line here if you like is that it doesn't matter who wins the Cuban authorities consider that both parties basic policy towards Cuba is of undermining the government and trying to foster what they would consider regime change by isolating the island politically and by and by squeezing it economically but if you talk to people on the streets a lot of people do appreciate the softening of tone and the modest measures under president obama and they are concerned that mitt romney might end the remittances on which so many people depend Okay, Michael Voss reporting live from Havana. Thank you so much for your report. Now let's turn to Rio de Janeiro, where Stephen Gibbs is standing by live. Rio, of course, is the site of the 2016 Summer Olympic Games and, of course, the upcoming World Cup. Stephen, thank you for joining us. What has Barack Obama's presen presidency so far meant to Brazil? Oh, I think undoubtedly during Mr. Obama's presidency, uh, relations between Brazil and the United States have got quite a lot warmer. But a lot of that is to do with the fact that coinciding with, with his presidency, uh, the Brazilian economy has got a lot bigger. So, uh, for example, in the last five years, uh, U.S. exports to Brazil have doubled. In the last year, 25% more Brazilians have have traveled to the United States. But despite all that, there are plenty of people here in Brazil and in the US who feel that uh, Mr. Obama perhaps could have done a bit more. There was one significant thing that happened earlier on in his presidency in 2009, 
when the United States lost its position as the number one trading partner with Brazil, that position now held by China. That's right. Obviously, some change there as Brazil is Latin America's economic powerhouse. Have the Brazilian people been following the U.S. presidential election at all? And if they have, any thoughts on Mitt Romney? Well, Mr. Romney is largely an unknown figure here in Brazil. The, the elections have not got anything like the coverage here, of course, as, as they have in the United States or in other regions of the world, in, including Europe. Um, so uh, if you ask Brazilians who they'd vote for, they, they, they tend to say they vote for the man they know, which is President Obama. There was one quite interesting uh, report in, in, a, in a Brazilian newspaper yesterday asking Brazilians who they'd vote for. 65% went for President Obama and just 6% for Mr. Romney. Okay, Stephen Gibbs reporting live from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Thank you so much.